Hello, Student of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with a video today talking about rigid body impulse and momentum. This is actually the final topic of the three kinetics topics that we've talked about. The first being Newtonian kinetics, which is acceleration based. The second being work and energy, which is velocity based. And then now also impulse and momentum, which is also velocity based. Now, the big difference between work energy and impulse momentum is space versus time. When we're looking at work and energy, that is going to be forces applied over a distance or moments applied over an angle. Now as we're getting into impulse and momentum, the impulse term is the product of force and distance. And we're also gonna end up with an angular impulse term, which is the product of moment and distance. And hopefully you remember some of that as we talked about this topic previously for particles. So let's go ahead here with a quick particle review. And we're going to create a small table, three columns, two rows. The first, or excuse me, the middle column here, we'll talk about linear terms. The last column, we'll talk about angular terms. The first row is going to focus on momentum. And the second row will focus on impulse. All right, so hopefully you remember that linear momentum for particles, we talked about the mass times the velocity vector. Now, for particles, we didn't need to worry about whether this is the velocity of the centroid or the velocity of anywhere else, because if something is translating, then the velocity of every point in that body is exactly the same. And furthermore, if we assume it's a particle, we're assuming all mass is concentrated at one location. Okay, so it's gonna be the velocity of that mass. For angular momentum, we use R cross MV. Now you've probably gotten a lot more comfortable with cross products as we've gotten into rigid body context, but this was our equation for our particle angular momentum. As we got an impulse, impulse in the most general form we could say is the integral of the sum of our force vectors dt. Now one thing you'll notice about impulse and momentum versus work and energy is we are back into a vector system. So similar to Newtonian kinetics, dealing with vectors versus scalars. And then angular momentum is the integral of the sum of our moments. Now all moments have to be about some point, so we'll just call that about point O as a vector dt. All right, so that's what we did for particles. Transitioning to rigid bodies honestly isn't that much of a stretch. I'll highlight a couple things that will end up changing. Um, we're going to change the location of that velocity. It'll turn out to be about the centroid. We're also, instead of using all of our mass concentrated at one single location, we now are going to have our mass distributed. And so we need to find out how that mass is distributed, which should make you think about the mass moment of inertia. And it turns out our impulse terms are going to look exactly the same. Okay, so getting into now our rigid body impulse momentum. For linear motion or the linear components um, of a body in general plane motion. Really, it's kind of the, the force and velocity-based components. We can write linear impulse momentum as the mass times the initial velocity of the centroid. So there's that change away from the velocity of any point to the velocity of the centroid. Um, plus an integral. Now notice I'm leaving a little bit of space here and here. I'm going to come back in and put some terms in there. So if you leave that space in your notes, that'll work best. So here's our impulse term. Sum of our forces as a vector dt, so integrating over time. And then our final momentum we can write as mv2 of the centroid, which is a vector. All right, so because we can deal with multiple rigid bodies, which are in constrained motion, I'm going to put a summation out front here of each one of these three terms. So we're going to put a little note up here. The summation is for multiple 
constrained bodies. Now things can be constrained in a number of ways. We can constrain them with cables like a pulley system. We can constrain them by simply having them attached to one another. Essentially any kind of a system with one degree of freedom where motion of one body is going to cause motion of the other bodies in that system. So getting now into our angular impulse momentum equation for rigid bodies. Also here, I'm going to come back in and put in that summation after I write out my terms. So it turns out for our angular momentum, right, before we use this R cross MV, we are now going to take into account the distribution of that mass. So our angular momentum equation for rigid bodies looks like the following. We have I of our centroid times our angular velocity omega one vector keeping in mind that angular velocities are consistent for an entire body we're going to add to that our impulse term looks exactly like it did for particles the sum of our moments now it does need to be about the centroid so we can put an m sub g and this is going to be dt taking a time integral and then this is going to be equal to our final angular momentum I bar times omega 2 vector. Once again, with the summations out front, if we have multiple particles, if you have a single particle, you don't need to worry about those summations, but for multiple particles, you do need to worry about those. So this is going to be the case for about the centroid, which is point G. We can also choose to sum our moments and find our momentum about other points. And so let me put a little note here, or, so this has very similar construct. It really honestly both Newtonian kinetics and also work energy, where we have kind of differing equations, whether we focus on the centroid or whether we focus on other points. So the most general form of this equation, if we choose some point that is, um, not the centroid, so for another non-centroidal point, I'm going to use the term O, you could use P, you could use O, or use O in this case. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to include what we call the momentum moment. Now, this is really similar to the kinetic moment that we dealt with for Newtonian kinetics. So we still need to include our I bar times our omega 1 vector. But we need to add to that our momentum moment, which is also going to be a cross product, R of G relative to our non-central point O. And we're going to cross this into the linear momentum of our centroid which is m v one bar vector. Okay, so once again, really, really similar. The only difference here being that in the inertia moment, we used our acceleration here for what we're now gonna call the momentum moment. We're going to use our velocity of the centroid. So that is our initial angular momentum about some non-centroidal point O. We add to that the impulse. Now the impulse does not change in general form. It's still going to be the sum of moments. It's just going to be about a different point, okay? About point O versus about the centroid point G. And this is also going to be a time integral. And then on the right side of our equation, we're going to have the same overall term, just everything sub two, so I bar, omega 2 vector plus r of g relative to o crossed with my m v 2 of the centroid as a vector. Now I did once again leave space here for my summations out front. So to put these in brackets, 
if we have multiple particles, we need to add up their momentums and add up the impulses on each one of those bodies. Okay, so that's my general equation, the most general. It turns out that this equation will work equally well about the centroid. It's just that in that case, your R of G relative to O would go to zero. So you'd be left with your I bar omega one. All right. Now, just like for some of the other topics, there are a couple of special cases. Uh, we're mainly going to focus on if you choose to some moments about an instantaneous center of zero velocity or a fixed axis. So let me write that one out to say that um, if you sum moments about an I, C, Z, V, then our equation actually simplifies quite a bit. It looks like the following. We have our mass moment of inertia about our I, C times our omega 1 vector of the body. We're going to add to that our impulse term, integral of the sum of moments about the instantaneous center, dt, that's still a vector. That's going to be equal to our i of our ic times our omega 2 vector. And again, multiple particles requires adding up the momentum and the impulse of each of those terms. And so feel free to use this equation. And you can see that really the main shift here is that we were basically using the parallel axis theorem uh, in this term here versus um, using the, the momentum moment. It turns out they're totally equal to one another. But if you're not summing moments about an instantaneous center, or a fixed axis, then you need to make sure to use the most general form here. Okay, so one more little quick review of this momentum moment. Let's say that we have a circular disc and it's rolling on a horizontal surface. And I didn't quite get it drawn perfectly here, but let's go ahead and assume it's touching at this point. And so this would be the ICZV of that body. And the centroid, of course, is going to be located in the middle. There's point G. Let's assume, for this problem, that we have multiple forces, say F1 and F2, which happen to both be um, coinciding here at this point O. And so because So because those forces are going to that point, maybe I want to go ahead and sum my moment about that point. And so we can go ahead and set up that equation. So if we want to find our angular momentum about O is going to be equal to my I bar times my omega as a vector plus my momentum moment term, my r of g relative to O crossed with my mass times my velocity of the centroid as a vector. So this position vector, the position vector of g relative to O goes from O down to g, r of g relative to O. Now keep in mind on this problem that if we're rolling across a horizontal surface, let's go ahead and make an assumption here that my omega is going to be going positive from the right hand rule. Because of that, my V bar better be going to the left if I have a non-slip point there at the ICZV at the base of that wheel. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add in my mass term here as well, just because the cross product here is gonna be with the scalar mass times the velocity. You could also multiply your mass and later you get the same value. So as we look at the components of this R of G relative to O, we have two of them. We basically have an X, I'm gonna call this an X prime component and a Y prime component. It's only gonna be the Y prime version that we're worried about right because as we cross that into this velocity the centroid it is perpendicular it turns out that the horizontal component is going to be parallel to mv therefore not creating a 
cross product. So to go ahead and just kind of rough out these numbers, now we could go to our table and find our I bar for the thin disk. I'll leave that up to you. I just really wanted to focus on the signs from the right-hand rule and the cross product. And so I'm going to say this is a positive omega. Positive because this omega here is positive from the right-hand rule. And then we add to that this cross product. Now the cross product is going to be going from O down here to the line of action of our linear momentum of the centroid. And so therefore that will be negative from the right hand rule uh, as we cross the R coming this direction into mass times velocity. So we could write the, the distance term as R of G relative to O the y component, however far that is vertically, times my mass times the velocity of my centroid. Now, if you wanted to reduce your number of unknowns, because we do have an ICZV, we could also observe that I have a second position vector here, call this r of g relative to my IC, and I could then replace my v bar with a omega times r of g relative to ic. Okay, and it turns out on this problem, because the distance here from o to g and the distance from g down to the instantaneous center is exactly the same value, both of these r's are actually going to have the same numeric value. But I just wanted to point out that they're not always going to be just a radius. They're going to be specific distances between two points. And so this would leave us um, all motion related to omega versus V and omega. And this is a very common thing you do in these problems, is try to reduce your number of unknowns, either get it all in terms of linear velocity V or angular velocity omega. So that concludes this overview video. Hopefully I've laid out the different details, how you use this equation on various types of problems, various types of bodies. I'll follow this up with two examples. One of those examples being a single body example and then a second example being a multi-body example.